Hey, Megan, it's awesome to meet you. Uh, thanks for joining us. You too, Kevin. I wish I could have met you in Las Vegas, but this will do. Next time, for sure. For sure. Uh, so, Megan, uh, I've really been looking forward to uh, to this, and you know, thanks again for you to uh, join our Building Builders podcast. Uh, maybe just to kick things off, would love to learn just a little bit more about yourself, and uh, um, you know, I've got some notes here about uh, your, your four daughters and you know the AEM, and I think there's a whole lot of pride there about uh, being the president of AEM. Let me just kind of hand it over. I'd love to hear a little. Uh, the fact that I'm in the office on a Friday afternoon where it's 80 degrees and sunny in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, <laughs> tells you how much I love my job. Um, again, that 80 degrees and sunny in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in April is not normal. So, uh, yeah. no, I'm happy to be here and um, feel very honored that you even wanted to spend all this time with me. But I born and raised here in a suburb of Milwaukee and uh, went to school in Wisconsin and lived for a little bit in Chicago, but basically I was hired as an intern at what was then SEMA. So um, now we're AEM, the Association of Equipment Manufacturers, representing construction, agriculture, forestry, mining, and utilities. But in the start, we were um, Construction Industry Manufacturers Association. So there was a merger along the lines in there. And uh, I was hired um, after my internship and, and you'd say the rest is history. So for me, uh, my husband and I got married and started having kids and um, my family, all they've known is mom travels, mom works someplace with a lot of men, and there's a lot of equipment <laughs> that does that does a lot of things. So, um, you know, started having kids, finally stopped having kids in 2011. So we do, we have four daughters, I have one in college. Um, so that's a whole interesting uh, concept of being a parent of a child in college when you remember what you did in college, or at least I remember what I did in college. So I have a 20 year old, an 18 year old who's a senior in high school, and then a, a 13 year old and a 11 year old both in middle school. So we're kind of spread out a little bit, but um, I, I have worked here, well, off and on, I did leave for a little bit for about 25 years and it's just something new and different every day. Uh, I love it. I love what I do. I love the industries I'm in and I love the people I work with. Awesome. Ooh. What drew you to the construction industry? So I don't know many people that weren't born into it that are drawn to the construction industry um, necessarily, but it was more along the lines of um, the association. And I didn't really know much about associations or construction. Um, it was a paid internship, I'm not gonna lie. And I say this because I think that there's a whole group of us that fell into this industry and liked where we landed. Like we had no desire to crawl out from it, right? So once I got here, I, w I started uh, working on trade shows. So that's the cool, fun stuff that you get to do, right? It's like planning the biggest party for 100,000 of your friends. And right. in doing that, um, I got to build relationships with the equipment manufacturers from all levels and learn about what they do and why they do it. And um, that just created a, a love for the industry within me, too. I think we uh, so love hearing that message. Um, I hear a similar message to that regularly. I think we... Uh, uh, we can all do better. We need to figure out a way to share that message and, and have it so that people don't fall into this fantastic job. Right, <laughs> they, right. They should know about it and, you know, really want to do it right out, out of, off the bat. But, um, yeah, great. Thanks for sharing. Mm -hmm. um, so we wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, Infrastructure uh, Investments and in the Jobs uh, Act. And, uh, um you know, talking about uh, the Infrastructure Act first, can you tell us uh, uh, just how significant the $1.2 trillion investments uh, will be for the industry? Well, I'll start first by saying that the investment is super important just <laughs> for the citizens that live in the country that are going to benefit from it, right? I mean, we're talking yes. about significant spending to bring our roads and bridges um, up to where hopefully, I mean, just up to where they should be. I mean, when you're talking about a very developed 
modernized country um, living with infrastructure that's graded between C's and D's when it comes to safety and, and structure and structural support and that it's just it's not right. Right. So for me, I think that, you know, the biggest thing is that this is going to benefit everyone um, for the industry specifically. It's it's pretty simple. Right. We represent equipment manufacturers. They make the equipment that's going to be used to um, better our roads and our bridges and our ports. And, and um, so that's significant right there in and of itself. Um, but then that's that's one slice of it. Right. So our industry has a bigger impact than just providing the equipment, of course. Um, mm -hmm. We provide a lot into just the American economy. Um, equipment manufacturers add about $315, $316 billion to the gross uh, GDP. And um, that's just in the United States alone based on last year's numbers. Uh, we represent about 7.5% of the total manufacturing output of the United States. And our workforce makes up about 11% of total manufacturing employment base. So you talk about the investment that'll be put in, the equipment you know, that can be made, that then can be sold, that then can be used. And there's all these jobs in play um, and all these families supported them too. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's tremendous. I love that you started with you know, the impact it's gonna have for you know, everyone. <laughs> and, uh, it's bigger you know, than you or I, right? It, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> How many times have you driven down the road and you've hit a pothole and you're like, crap, what did that do? It, and pop a tire or do something like that. I mean, there's such a big impact or maybe I know too much, but when you're driving over certain bridges, I almost, <laughs> it's almost yeah. like you wanna hold your breath. Like, is this one of those bridges? <clears throat> And I don't mean to, I don't mean to inappropriately scare anyone, but we've yeah. heard those stories. They've been happening, um, and right. they should be. We're strong enough, smart enough, um, wealthy enough country to avoid those things. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think you're you're completely right that it's not. The message here is not to kind of you know scare <laughs> people, but I, I do think that. Um, um, you know, when, when we think about it, it's a lot more than potholes. There, there's some very, very big projects <laughs> to be done here. And yeah, the, there's the small nuisances of, of potholes, but, uh, there's some very important work being done um, yeah. as well. <clears throat> um, can you, uh, uh, talk a little bit about, uh, the AEM's role in getting something, uh, uh, like the IGA to pass, uh, at the highest level of government? Yeah, so AEM is a, we're a bipartisan organization. We focus on um, the, the policies, not the politics. And I, I start with that. I think it's very important to say, you know, we, we talked about what, is, what does this investment mean? It means a lot to everyone. Well, having an, this infrastructure act passed benefits whoever you are, from whatever political side you're from, whatever beliefs you might have, like this is for everyone. So for us, we work tirelessly on the Hill, um, whether it's partnering with other associations or having those direct meetings with our lawmakers or their staff, sharing the importance of this investment and what it can do um, just for safety, right? For, for our environment to have, um, uh, you know, less emissions out there, whatever it might be, you know, you have better gas mileage to get places, you're, you're spending less money at the pump, all of those things. Um, uh, to really share what the importance is um, of this investment. And um, I would say our team uh, based in DC has a really strong, solid voice. And through the partnerships that we had, we were able to you know, get this act to the president's desk for, for signing. What was that, 21? Wow. 21, and we're still talking about the impact. You know, what is this gonna mean? That's the other challenge, right? It was right. signed in the end of 21, and we're still talking about how we're going to pay for it. It's like, just get it done. Just get it done. <laughs> get that money out there. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's exciting. Congratulations. Um, Thank you. <clears throat> uh, can you tell me a little bit more? So, uh, sorry, I want to go back to um, the inf inf infrastructure spend. Um, can you talk about the relationship between the investment in infrastructure and how uh, that plays a part in uh, in equipment manufacturing and construction, what exactly is the relationship yeah. uh, between the industries? So, you know, the, the more investments that are made in infrastructure, 
the more projects that are developed and put out to bid, and then the more contractors that will need equipment. Um, you know, really, our members are here to 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 build the equipment and provide that equipment um, for the contractors that that need to use it to make the projects happen. And to maybe clarify a little bit too, when I'm talking about our industry, I mentioned it before: equipment manufacturers. It's equipment manufacturers of off-highway equipment, right? So it's not everything that's out there yeah. um, and components. And, and our portion of the industry alone um, employs roughly 425,000 American workers. You know, and what does wow. that mean? That, that directly um, translates into that the equipment manufacturing industry supporting 2.35 million jobs, um, wow. both in direct and indirect employment just here in the United States. So, you know, when you talk about investment in infrastructure, there's so much more that comes out of it. That, you know, that trillion dollars sounds like a lot, but yeah. it has that ripple effect of how it's, we support the economy. We, we support jobs and from the coffee shop down the street, right? To the, right. you know, the 7-Eleven on the corner where you can grab a sandwich, whatever it might be, or the diner, you know, across the way to, to grab lunch. And these are all things that are, that are created um, through this investment. That's a staggering number of jobs and a staggering number of people um, that it touches. Yeah, but even when I talked about that 420, well, it's 427,000 to be more exact, but there's probably close to 100,000 open jobs sitting out there too. So, right. you know, when you talked about how we get the message out so we're not falling into this, it's, it's, it's dire that we share this message and the value of what uh, this industry can bring to your daily life or to you as, you know, a person who's of working age that needs a career, not just a job, a career. I mean, it's a viable yes. career that this offers here. So it's a very rewarding career. It's not just a nine to five job for sure. Yeah. Well, and I think that's correct, of course. And I think there were jobs before that, you know, was always seen that way. Oh, you've got, you're working terrible hours, whatever it is. If all of us that <laughs> that have gone through COVID didn't work crazy hours or different hours, I mean, come on! Now everyone's used to it. I could I could sit there and get a lot of work done from five to seven, take a break. My husband and I get the kids ready for school, whatever it is, make lunches, then go back to work. Whether it's you know come into the office or at home, I mean, when you say you know crazy you know, a lot of hours or whatever it is, we're all doing that anyway. What I miss then is being outside. So here, here's a here's yeah. an opportunity to offer you a chance to work inside, outside, with your hands, with your brain, whatever it is, you know, that you find value in or that you, you get excited about. I went to school to be a landscape architect thinking that it was important to be, you know, the designer and, you know, wanted to get that piece of paper. And yeah. when I came in and it was time to find a job, I was like, I don't want to be behind a desk. <laughs> I want to be outside. And okay. yeah, I went in so that I could be out and designing landscapes and be part of it, but uh, ended up uh, pivoting and making sure that I stayed outside. And, do you, you know, so do you do job. any of that now still? Are you still doing that or? Not enough. Just for fun? <laughs> yeah, if for I sure. If I send you a I, picture, would you decide? <laughs> I, I definitely would uh, help. And uh, yeah, I would say, uh, especially, I mean, it's spring this time of year, you know, uh, there's We're a lot all going of crazy. happening in our house for sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll be spreading mulch tonight, you know, 100% <laughs> and dreaming of different plants that could complement right. our garden. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so I, 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 maybe kind of switching a little bit here, I wanted to ask you about the, uh, the AAM uh, economic impact report and um, kind of specifically to, you know, the impact on uh, uh, small towns and sort of the importance of these importance of the small towns and, you know, the uh, man, manufacturing industry that is there. Yeah, there's and so that question kind of for me evokes a couple different directions that you can go in. Um, you know, we represent the off-road equipment manufacturers, so we also are in the agriculture space. So you can see some of the different equipment you right. know, behind my head here. So, I see the a, yeah, a very strong <laughs> farm economy. It doesn't only benefit farmers and ranchers; it also helps to, of course, protect the um, agriculture equipment manufacturing jobs across the U.S. That 
segment represents 650,000 jobs. Um, I think supporting rural America, um, but it's not just about supporting, of course, the farm economy. It is, it's so much more. Um, what I encountered during, again, COVID, and I hate bringing that up, right? But so I live fairly close to the city and we had um, internet problems, right? And all I kept hearing from my friends who are in rural areas, I have a college roommate, she and her husband um, have a farm and, and she's a teacher and she said, the connectivity is so, is so bad. It's just so terrible. So when we talk about, you know, the farm communities and the, this, economic impact report and, and what could happen if we're not supporting these small communities, whether with a thriving, you know, manufacturing um, business or the basic utilities needed, we're, we're going to see these companies or these towns just kind of get smaller and smaller. And that's going to have a huge impact on us, right? So you're growing the food in one place, but you want the food to end up over here. Well, how are you going to get that food from one spot to another? You need strong roads. You need these equipment manufacturers based throughout, not just big cities and other areas. Um, we've got to draw from the workforce from a number of different places. Um, but this, this, this challenge is that part of this infrastructure act needs to go to fund um, you know strong utilities in these areas um, the strong safe roads and bridges to move products from one place to another we're just you know it's funny that you say people are leaving the small towns and then but they're leaving the big towns too so where's everyone going if some are leaving small towns and some are leaving big towns <laughs> we've got to figure out where this disconnect is I don't know I saw a, a migration map recently, and it looks like everyone's going to Florida. <laughs> it seems like a lot of people are heading south. And I, it's warm I get and that. I get that. Well, except they just got a foot of rain in like a minute, you know, there. So right. they, I, I get it as far as the 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 weather. I I would wonder if that's still the case with all that's going on. I, I'm not going to get political. But with all yeah. the politics that are going sure. on, I, you have to. It'd be interesting to see how that map shakes out in a, a year or two. Right. Do you think that uh, investment in ins infrastructure in small towns is overlooked? I do. I do at times. Yes. You know, when you're talking about where the big tax dollars are coming from to fund different things, right? Um, and who's got the loudest voice or whatever it is, but. I do know our equipment manufacturers are standing up and representing the needs that they have in these smaller towns. I think, um, you know, be just just being able to enhance the, you know, the rural broadband would be a huge, a huge benefit. And part of this act could go could go towards funding that. So you can live anywhere. Some I know Milwaukee is not a small town. But people, why do you live there? I said, I can live here and I can get anywhere else I need to. I can connect with anyone I want to. You could live in any small town basically now and work almost yep. anywhere or get anywhere. But we need to keep supporting the services for those small, um, those public utilities. Like I said, the rural broadband is a huge part of it. And then make the connectivity easier. So again, with better roads or bridges, you know, you're going to spend less time on the roadways. Um, you, know, you can get into electrical vehicles. I, I don't know if we're going to or not, but, you know, just that better efficiency, make it more cost effective. And then that kind of takes the challenges away or the cons away from someone who's debating if they should live in small town or large town. Equalize it a little bit without adding the things that the small town people hate. Bring them the things they need, right? Access sure. to strong internet or something, you know, fresh, clean water. I mean, these are basic things that could, I think, make a difference. Uh, agreed with all of those. Uh, funny how uh, um, clean water and strong internet are right beside each other in that conversation. You yeah. know, uh, I guess that's a 2023. Uh, it sounds like you, you have uh, a passion around electric vehicles. Um, was there something there that you wanted to share? Well, I don't know. Yes or no. So for us, um, I think, uh, well, and we just, what was just passed that um, for automobiles that they all need to be electric by a certain year. I forgot it was, it just was going through legislature. They were just discussing it, but um, you know, that impacts us as well. Off-road equipment. Um, 
it's whether it's electrical or something else, it's just reducing, you know, the the uh, dependency on fossil fuels that can help to make a, a difference. You know, our industry is very concerned and engaged with um, sustainability initiatives and wanting to do what's in the best interest of, of everyone, you know, our environment and our people. Um, and so I think right now there's so much attention on electric, it makes sense. But you, again, you need that infrastructure in place to support the move towards electric vehicles. Um, and the cost right now, when we're talking automobiles, it's, it's pretty high for the average American to be able to purchase um, an electric vehicle. Now, I know there's cost savings down the road, but you've got kids that are graduating college and can't find a job. How are they going to afford a $50,000 car in hopes that they're going to save on gas in 10 years? What? When you were 22, yeah. did you think that far down? No. So I, I, I think it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty cool in our industry to see. I, I know you weren't in Las Vegas. We were just at Connex Wilconeg to see, you know, solar powered equipment and the electrical vehicles that were out there, the hydrogen yep. cell batteries like that. I get super excited about, about that. And Kevin, you can stop me anytime here, hmm. but it, to me, it goes back to that changing the perception of our industry, right? There were the three yep. D's, you know, that it's dangerous, it's dark, it's dirty. It's not, it's, it's really, it's in, we're in like the precipice of greatness here with the direction that we're going. And I just wish that more people, you know, would understand or embrace it or learn about it. Don't assume, right? Don't assume that it was the way it used to be. There's so much change. Right. A lot, that all started with electrical vehicles. <laughs> well, it leads me right into my next question about how do we get more people into this industry? Um, you know, what, what, what's stopping them? How do we, you know, bring them? Yeah, I, well, one is talking about it and sh showing the the faces and and sharing the stories um, of how various people got into this industry. I think for our young people, it's getting to the parents, um, you know, and saying, "I know you want every generation wants something better, right for for their for their kids." but we're looking at a time when this next generation is not gonna make more than us, that they're gonna be struggling, that it's gonna be harder for them to find the jobs that perhaps yeah. they're, you thought they could find. And what we offer here in this industry is just solid career. Um, you could start as an intern, you can start as a machinist and you could become an engineer and you could be a CFO, a CEO, a CEO, whatever it is. I mean, there's a lot of different paths and opportunities, but even just starting out, in this industry, um, their family supporting jobs. You can start at almost $90,000. That's the industry average for us. And that is well above what um, the career or, you know, job average is in other industries. I We get to these kids, kids young, they're 22 years old, they're 20 years old, they're driving this brand new pickup truck because they can afford it. You know, get those stories out there. Like, I know you just went to school and now you're 60, 70, $100,000 in debt. And I don't know how long it's gonna take you to pay that back. You could start off right here, get into one of these jobs. If you wanna go to college, they'll pay for your college for you, right? And you could be earning money as you're going. Um, I, I think we just gotta change the perception and. We got to get to the parents and tell them it's not dirty and dangerous and dark. It's clean and fulfilling and exciting and challenging. And safe. It is very safe. Right. Yeah. I mean, I was in India and I toured um, one of our members manufacturing facilities and I think, oh my gosh, you go to India and oh, what's that like? And you know, it, it is what it is. I'm in this manufacturing facility. It was so clean. You could have, I wasn't going to, but you could have eaten off the floor. I mean, it's bright. There's natural light. It's mm -hmm. it's clean. It's safe. There's robotics. It's technologically advanced. I mean, right. I just there's misperceptions out there. Yeah. Um, so my team shared with me some uh, one of your thoughts around uh, schooling and how mm -hmm. uh, you know kids are uh, or kids. Um, Young adults, no, no, what do we call them? Yeah. Yeah, I know. Like, I can't believe I just said kids. I'm one of <laughs> am I that old now? I'm that person. Yeah, um, you're that person now. <laughs> I used to hate those people. I know. Oh, we we are those people. It's hilarious. <laughs> I'm super embarrassed. <laughs> uh, so, um, 
yeah, you had this really insightful uh, thought. Can you kind of share a little bit more about uh, that sort of yeah. college university experience? I know what you're talking about. So this is based on my daughter number two. She's 18, and she's finishing up her senior year in high school. And my husband and I um, never really thought a four-year college was the right thing for her. You know, and we don't push our kids one way or another, right? We'll support them in what they want to do. And we are in a college prep town. You know, my ex and my oldest is in her second year of university. All my friends are going. I want to, I don't want to live at home. I want to go, you know, live with my friends. Well, you could, you could go to a tech school. You could go to this or whatever. I'd still have to live at home. I can't afford an apartment, you know, whatever. And we, I thought about that. I was like, what if she had the opportunity? So she could go work somewhere and they provide housing. They provide her the experience she's looking for while she's learning. Maybe she's learning about the job. She's not taking a class she doesn't need. She doesn't mm -hmm. need an English class. She's not gonna do anything with it. She doesn't need one more math class. As long as she can figure out the percentage on a sales rack, she's good. And I'm not downplaying those that do need that. My Again, yeah. my older daughter's in all that, but she just wants that experience to be on her own. And And I thought about it too, and I thought, well, who's I thought about it more since I made this comment in Vegas. Well, who's responsible for that? You know, the OEMs or the people that want, that need this workforce? Not necessarily. I'm going to pay for her anyway to go to school and live in the dorms and get that experience. And more than likely, she'll make it a year. If she does more, great. If she doesn't, great. We'll figure it out. But I'm going to pay for that dorm. So then I was mm -hmm. thinking, huh, so what if it was sort of like a partnership or an agreement? Like, we're going to offer your child, here's a safe place, here's a dorm, here's food, on-the-job training, maybe some life skills. You know, they yeah. don't want to listen to us so much. Maybe there's something wrapped around in there. And maybe I'm paying for her dorm because I would have done it anyway. And then there's yeah. kids that can't afford it. Fine, then you figure out scholarships or programs, you know, that it's kind of leveled up. But I just... I was thinking there's a way maybe tech schools have to offer or should offer dorms. I have a friend whose son is at a tech school. They offer no dorms. It's not near his home so that they found, you know, a, an elderly woman who was looking to rent a room. So he lives with this 80 year old woman. He takes care of all the snow and anything she needs. And that's great. They found that, but not everyone's going to find that. And he lives with an 80 year old woman, he's not living with people his age. He's not getting to know the kids in the program or anything. So I just, I think there's something we could do about that. I definitely think there's something. As soon as I heard that, I hadn't really thought about this in the past. And up in Canada, we have university and college. And I went to college before I went to university and it was a totally different experience. There's a lot of things that I really loved, but you know, going to college, it was kind of like, you know, why aren't you going to university, right? Like, there's a lot of, I could feel it. I could feel people thinking and you're like, probably saying it. Like, Whether they're judging you or not, you felt like they were? I felt like they were, yeah. Whether they were or weren't, right? And then, you know, the, the part that made it feel like just, just that little extra bit of depressing was it, it, it wasn't the same experience. So I, had a, I did have a really great experience, but I was watching you know, friends uh, go to university and, you know, the, you know, they were staying in dorms, whereas I was renting, you know, a room in a house. Yeah. The, the dorm wasn't available. It was, yeah. you know, it's like, I kind of would have liked to do that. You know, I, I missed out on that, that experience. Now then I went to university and I got it. But uh, I, I think... Um, I think I think you're you're hitting on something here that you know many of us may not be thinking about. So. I, don't, I don't think it would be as hard. It's some sort of even if it was a partnership with a tech school, you know, and a couple yeah. OEMs got together in one area. So where we are really close to us is Komatsu Mining and and Case and Manitowoc, and there's a, a whole bunch more, right? So what if they work together with some sort of tech school and said, listen, we'll invest some money in this. Maybe there's some general classes, they get some branding, they get first pick at graduates or, you know, or whatever it is, and then kids can choose. And then if they sign with an OEM, then that OEM could take over the cost of getting, you know, then that kid has to stay, young adult, ugh, has <laughs> to stay there, commit for a year or two of employment, you know, whatever. I just, I think there's other ways we could do this if we, just thought differently. Yeah, totally. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Uh, I'm so now that the uh, the um, infrastructure act is is signed, 
where do you think um, uh, the next investment should be in construction? It's interesting that you ask that and say the next investment, because even though it's signed, <laughs> the funding mm-hmm. isn't doled out yet, right? So, I right. mean, I'd like us to finish what we started, um, right. especially because ever since I, well, not ever since I've been here, it's been at least 10 years since we were struggling to get something signed and we just kept having extension after extension. And I and I hope we avoid that. Um, right. But I, you know, I think beyond the, the roads, the bridges, the ports, I mentioned it, that r- the rural broadband is so important. And yeah. The, the water access to fresh, clean water is, you would think we should be talking about this in third world, world countries, and we're talking about it here. You know, whether the water's coming down from you guys and it's getting stopped somewhere by ranchers, and then we have people with no I, I, I realize now that I'm getting older how lucky I am to live on one of the Great Lakes. I mean, never did I think it was going to be something that I maybe saw in the movies where... <laughs> We're going to, you know, we monetize access to this water. And well, what's, how is that going to, how is that sustainable? So I, yeah. I'm excited to see investments in rural broadband. Like I said, the, the clean water um, and then putting the talk about um, sustainability initiatives to, to work, you know, seeing the changes that we can, we can make so that this planet is here for all of our kids and grandkids, you know, well beyond what we're currently yeah. looking Awesome. What uh, what advice would you give uh, somebody looking to join uh, the trades today? Um, you know, honestly, I think if somebody was unsure about it, I would encourage them to talk to people in the industry. It's it's crazy how open and inviting people are in this industry. You you can talk to the CEO of one company or you could talk to a product manager or you could get in and talk to somebody on the shop floor, ask them questions. I mean, I, and if not, then, you know, read up on, on the industry a little bit and see the growth and see the potential and, and, you know, get into the, some of the census data and understand that this offers viable careers, you know, with living wages and that. Um, I would, I would say if you don't feel like a desk job is for you, you might want to consider it. You know, and just yeah. ask, do an internship. We have at any given time here at AM, we have, and we're, we're in the office, but we're out too. We're out there with our members and with our events. We have seven to eight interns roughly here at any given time. And they're just wow. learning and they have access to the OEMs. They have access to the presidents and the CEOs of these companies and they get to talk to them and ask questions. Just, you know, get involved, try an internship someplace where you never thought you would do it and see what happens. And if you don't like it, you're young enough, your resume is not long enough that you, you could quit, move on somewhere else. Just keep that off your resume if it doesn't work out, right? <laughs> Just check, check it out somewhere else. That, uh, that internship sounds pretty amazing. Is that, is that a pretty competitive uh, spot to get into? Um, I, well, I, right now there's so many people looking and you, know, you could work at Target and make $15 an hour. So it is hard to remain you know, competitive with that. But um, we haven't had any problems filling our internships and we pull kids, young adults from all over the place. So it's, right. it's, it's been, I believe a pretty, well, like I said, I started as an intern. It can be right. a fairly rewarding job. Love it. Um, so last question, uh, Megan, we always, you know, like to ask people, uh, what their, their favorite piece of equipment is. I see a bunch in the background. Um, is it one of those, uh, what's your favorite piece? My favorite piece of equipment is a piece of equipment that's working. <laughs> it's out there that it's on a job site or in a field and, and it's working. So, um, you know, we've got, we, we show all of this fun stuff, all the brand new stuff at all of our events at. Again, we were in Vegas for Con Expo, Con Egg, and IFB, and then we've got Utility Expo and World of Asphalt and Commodity Classic, and that's really nice to see that pretty shiny stuff, and they let you climb on it, but the best is when it's out there in the field work. <laughs> well said. Uh, where can uh, where can our listen- listeners find you and connect with you? Um, I'm on LinkedIn, Megan Tunnell. Um, <laughs> probably the best way. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Uh, this has been great, Megan. Thanks so much for uh, taking the time. I know it's uh, 
great weather and I, I won't stand in front of, uh, you know, you getting inside here any longer. So <laughs> thank you. Know, you Anna. I'm headed, I'm headed up north your way next month. I'll be in Waterloo and Gulf. Oh, I, li- I live in Guelph and our mm-hmm. office is in Kitchener, which is you Are you serious? Waterloo. Yeah. Uh, so Linda Hassenfratz, who's the CEO of Linamar right there, yes. she's our treasurer. So I'm going to go spend some time with her. And then oh, I'm yeah. coming in town in Waterloo is, I think it's called Innovate Canada, um, okay. an event that's going on. So they're talking about all the technology and great innovation uh, coming out of different spots in Canada. And then we're looking to hold um, a summer board meeting up there. So I'm going to meet with a couple different cities there. So. Oh, wow. I can't believe I'm going to be so connect. close to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe, uh, maybe we should have done this in person a drink or something. We yeah. definitely should have done this in person. <laughs> Sounds awesome. Um, yeah. Cool. So, well, uh, maybe we take that part offline, but uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks yeah. Again for take your time. care. You have a great weekend. <laughs>